But one day, it's Thursday, April 7th, 2022. And this is the week in charts. I just want to thank all you guys and girls for being here. Looks like more and more people are finding the show. That's pretty exciting. Thank you very much. If you would like to watch live, bring your questions, stock picks, crypto picks, or anything else, go to davelander.com slash webinar. Re register you for the week. The link is old. I probably need to take a date out of that thing. All right, what are we talking about? Well, obviously, current market conditions. I'll have a tremendous amount to say about that. Your questions on trading, your favorite stock picks and crypto picks. For crypto, just put a dollar sign in front of it and hold off until we get the live charts, just so your question doesn't accidentally get deleted in one per line, if you don't mind. That's also for your benefit. All right, let's talk about a good problem to have, maximizing profits on windfalls, which just happened every day. Before we do all that, that's, there's a disclaimer screen. As you know, you can lose money trading or as I'll sum it up. All predictions are about the future and a lot of stuff can happen between now and then, barring a line from my buddy, Greg Morse. All right, let's talk about a good problem to have and how I dealt with it this time. And I kind of wanted to, I was a little hesitant to do tonight's presentation because it involves options and it can get a little messy quickly. And I don't have all the answers but I want to show you what I did in this particular case. So this is SST. If you watch the Trading Simplified show, you know that this was mentioned as a mystery chart. And the mystery charts usually, I'd say 99 out of 100 times, come straight from a trading service. So this was a buy at 1575, projective stop of 1175, IPT of 1975. And this is what that looks like on the charts. Nice little trend higher, followed by a pullback. Entry was here. Stop was down here, and the IPT was up here. Now, the entry was not that close when I initially recommended it, but the stock began to rally after I initially, initially recommended it. So the entry was up here when the stock was down here, just FYI on that. Now, we were blessed with this nice little run higher. Now, the IPT was at 1975, as you saw on the prior slide, and... Because we had such a nice move overnight, what I did was I trailed the stop on half of my shares. Remember, for those who aren't familiar with the methodology and the money management, we exit half of our shares at the initial profit target, and then we hold on, sometimes for dear life, on the remainder of the shares via a widening trailing stop to hopefully, and I know it's a word you should never use in this business, be with the position for a long, long time. Now, I was looking for 1975 for the IPT, and I was able to squeeze out an extra $3 via a trailing stop. So I saw that I beat the system by $626. As I was going live, I was thinking maybe beating the system is a bad way of putting it, but by using a little discretion like this, I improve upon results. The idea is to beat the system. For instance, let's say something triggers at 15 and then the stock falls out of bed and you forget to take the setup or whatever, and it's dropping like a stone. You're, you're not going to rush out and try to buy it at 13 or 12 or 11 or whatever while it continues to drop. Easy for me to say. But there are cases where a little discretion can go a long ways. Now, the other thing I did was when it was, I think it was on its round trip back from 37. I was very concerned that everything could evaporate really, really quick, and it did, or a significant amount did. Remember, this stock was up 100% overnight, and I forget how many halts it had, maybe four halts at least. It seems like it was halted most of the day. I was looking at an intraday chart. It was missing a lot of bars. I'm like, what the hell's going on? And I realized, oh, those were halts. Anyway, so after... All was said and done, and this thing looks like it was continuing to drop. I began to think, it's like, well, wait a minute, Dave. Technically, I should still be in this position. Because looking to the service, it would not have stopped out. So I noticed it was beginning to rally in after hours. So I went ahead and put back on those 200 shares that I sold, okay? And I picked it up at after hours for 19.47. So it was at 27.89 where I got out and it dropped and I got back in at 19.47.
So I saved $1,684, add that to the $626, that's $2,310 improvement on the trade. So I beat the system, and again, I probably shouldn't say beat the system, improved upon results, okay, by $2,310. Now, before you get too excited and too impressed, hang on a second, there was something else that I did which sort of failed miserably, but it also helped me accomplish my goal. It, it's funny, coming into this presentation, I'm like, geez, I shouldn't be showing you this stuff because you can think of an idiot. But then it's like, no, 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 I think I should show you things warts and all. And also, it did allow me to do what I wanted to do with this position, at least momentarily. So when it shot higher and was super duper oversold, trading at 30 something dollars a share, I knew this thing was going to probably come back in hard. And what I was thinking is, okay, this thing's going to drop like a stone. I'm going to lose X, okay? Let's just say I'm going to lose $5 easily. What if I could buy options for $5, okay, and keep my position, so to speak, by exiting the shares? Now, I'm going to talk about a way to kind of play both ends against the middle a little bit, and I may have gotten burned on that, and I'll explain that in one second. Now, the other thing you wanna do is reduce margin, okay, or your, your total exposure. So let's say you had 200 shares in a case like this, and it's at $3,600 a share. Well, initially, 200 times, what's that, 16, that'd be like $3,200 $3, a share. Well, all of a sudden, now you've got $7,000 in one stock. So depending on the size of your portfolio, that could have a sizable move, especially if you had on a thousand shares or so, like I'm gonna show you in just one second. But how can I keep my position, so to speak, just in case this thing goes up 100% tomorrow, right? And how, can I, how do I take risk off? So that's where the options came in. Now, here's the problem that I ran into, and I sort of did this in an automatic way, and before, I realized what had happened. It's like I was quickly to get out. In fact, I think this one trade lasted about two minutes. So the highest strike they had at the time because the options were new to this stock was 22. And the stock's trading up around 30 something dollars a share or close to 30 at least. That's just way too far. So it was somewhere up here. That is way too deep in the money for me to achieve my goal because if I try to hang on those options and exit my shares, now I have eight points at risk plus the premium, which I think was 990 or so. So stocks trading here, the strike is way too far away. So this is where I made a bit of a, I'm not gonna say a huge mistake, but it was a mistake to buy those options. And you can see I ended up paying 890 for those options. And as I was putting together my slides a little while ago, I'm like, holy crap. I flipped those things out within 10 minutes. The markets just imploded on me and I had to quickly scramble and exit the remainder of my shares, which I got out at, at 27.89. Now, to be frank, what I was sort of trying to do was double up on my position. And it didn't work in this case, but I'm gonna show you a case where it did work actually today. But you gotta be really careful when you're kind of playing both ends against the middle like that by buying the option and then the stock. So let's say you're long, well in this case it's easy, it's a 200 shares, so I needed two options, okay? So I effectively doubled my position. If this thing is running and you can get those options, which is hard, I know when the market is going up, but if you can get those options for not a ridiculous amount of premium and you still have your shares, then you can look to flip out your shares at a higher price and you improve upon your exit and you still have your position. So adding in a loss of 330 times two, that's a $660 loss in 10 minutes, by the way. Now all's well that ends well, it did allow me, of course, to having those options on did allow me to flip out my shares, but unfortunately I was quickly forced out of the options too. That's not the goal of this. The goal of this is to 
flip out your shares, hopefully at a higher level, effectively doubling, doubling up for a little while, okay? And then uh, hanging on to those options so you still have a position. And on top of all that, you have reduced your risk significantly, okay? So I lost $660. I kind of beat the system, so to speak, or improved upon the system, I should say, by $2,310. So don't feel too sorry for me in this case. It turned out $1,650 for the better. Now, I did this in more than one account. And in this particular case, I was able to get an exit of $2,245 versus $1,975. And so that made a $1,350 a improvement on the trade. And then when I ended up flipping out the shares at a higher level, I exited those shares at for an $8.31 for an $8 profit time 500. And that's on the total position from the entry. From the new entry, I should say, okay. So <laughs> I got cream for $2,950 in about seven or eight minutes on this particular one so after all was said and done it ended up working out okay so still was able to get 25 55 out of this position now let's take a look at the money on a real basis so on the first trade it was 1400 shares now you notice that i got in a little late that's another mistake, okay? And, and part of tonight, I was thinking like, do I want to tell you guys this or all this or not? But part of the mistake, part of what I wanted to do is show you that I don't always do these things in a perfect manner. But longer term, as long as I'm striving to get better, hopefully I'll get better and better and better and make fewer mistakes. But I did miss the initial entry on this stock. It had already started coming back in when I went to jump into stock. I knew I had to be long the stock, but I actually ended up getting in higher than the open because I messed around and I wasn't able to get in exactly when I was supposed to get in. So I did make a mistake on my entry. That's why the entry was a little bit higher than your entry, which I think was 1575. But anyway, so this is how it worked out on a net net basis. So if you look at all the closed trades, it was 3,618 on the first trade in one account, another account, it turned out to be $9,026, less the option debacle, debacle after you add that up. So it's 12.8 minus 3,600. And it turned out to be 9,244. So don't feel too sorry for me for making some mistakes in here. But the, the bottom line is when you're blessed with a windfall, be careful not to fritter it away. And I, I lost what is it, uh, close to $4,000 really quickly on this because everything kind of got away from me and I might've gotten a little caught up in, in the excitement of the moment. Now, when I was putting together the slides, I'm thinking it's gonna look like I'm being, I'm bragging about all this, but the reality is I'm kind of bitching, <laughs> you know? And that's the thing about this business is I didn't think that, I made like 10 grand overnight. I just thought like, damn it, I lost like four grand in 10 minutes. And that's kind of how I went home thinking. And then, you know, later on at night, I'm like, well, you know, you did okay, Dave. You know, don't beat yourself up too bad. <laughs> so I, I kind of totally screwed up the options. I sort of did it automatically without thinking. And, and that was a mistake. I should not have bought those options that we're so far into the money, maybe slightly in the money. And I'm gonna show you another example in a second that actually worked out a little bit better. Now, again, deep in the money options kind of defeats the purpose of risk off. So I wanted to get the risk off to where I was only gonna risk about three or four points and remain to the trade. And before you do it, I had options for $9.90, okay? So now I have 10 bucks risk, which sort of is, is the risk that I had just with the outright position. And I lost money on those options. Now, assuming that there's no 
options, and, and that's one thing I thought about yesterday, or day before actually, when this happened, is that I don't necessarily have a concrete plan for dealing with this this good problem, so to speak. Here's my little air quotes. <laughs> In that, probably the best thing I can tell you is, is Linda Rasky used to say, feed the ducks while they're quacking. So if you're not familiar with options or if they don't have options or if they don't have viable options and all they have is a deep in the money option, then peel off a few hundred shares here and there or even a hundred shares, okay? So think about that. Now I know it'd be impossible to get that high tick, but let's say you peel off 100 shares and the thing drops 17 points intraday or whatever, you just pulled an extra $1,700 out, okay? And as one of you guys pointed out, you know, how often does it, one of you guys miss the move and was kind of bummed out? And I'm like, dude, just be in it for the long haul, okay? And and the markets will always be there. And he's like, well, how many times do you get a 100% move overnight? I'm like, well, you know, you got to be on that one, but as long as you play the game and keep chipping away at it, you will eventually catch some of these, okay? And it seems like they come along just enough <laughs> to make it all worthwhile. So there's no really right answer, and I'm actually kind of opening it up for debate, you know, on how you want to do this. Uh, like Jeff says, he says, uh, puts available at the nosebleed prices now. Yeah, you know that's another that's another option, so to speak. Um, I find that I get myself in trouble when I'm long a market and I want a market to go up, and I start buying puts against that market. Now, I'm not saying that that's something that you should explore, but for me and the way my mind works, okay, if I could sell the stock and get that thousands and thousands or tens of thousands of dollars in this case off the market okay so what's you know i, I know it just stayed there for a second but 37 times 500 equals so you know eighteen thousand five hundred dollars left in a stock that started out as a much much smaller position so 500 times uh what was it yeah so the original original size was like was like eight thousand at least on those remaining shares so there's no right there's no right answer other than I think the only thing I could say if you had to do something and didn't know what to do, I would say peel off some shares after that second or third halt or whatever when it keeps when it seems like it's never gonna go away. When you start when you pull your calculator out, and I think I read that in Market Wizards, but I could tell you from personal experience, and I try to almost make it automatic. Whenever I pull my calculator out, I almost immediately sell a few hundred shares of whatever I'm I'm looking at at the time or a few options or whatever. So again, there's there's no right answer unless there were some options that weren't too overpriced. And and you know, I was looking at the IV on some of these earlier. In fact, some of the ones that I own, and uh it was like 300 or 400 percent something ridiculous. Now these things don't come along that often, but even though I got beat up a little bit the day before, I was given a second chance. And believe me, I'm not complaining I got beat up. You know, <laughs> again, all's well, that ends well, but that's that's the thing about after you've been trading for a while, you don't look at what you made, you look at how you could have done better. And I think that's how you become better at anything, okay? It's kind of like, um, Phil Helmuth versus, I can't think of the other guy's name right now, but uh, poker player, Annie Duke talked about him quite a bit. And at the bar afterwards, even if he won the game or the tournament or whatever, he's not talking about how great he did, like Phil Helmuth. He's talking about, man, I messed up that third hand in the fourth game or whatever it was. And it's kind of interesting the way he looks at things. And I think that as a trader, you're always looking to get better because there's so many ways you can improve. Now, here's a scenario. You have a stock that's up quite big, quite a big overnight. I'm not sure what, what uh, language I'm speaking there, but uh, stock up quite a bit overnight or a big overnight. 
Okay, so you come in and you earn a stock and it's up about three or four points, kind of like SST was today. Now, you know that profits have the potential to evaporate really, really quickly, okay? And it's kind of like the bottle rocket thing that it did two days ago, right? But you also don't want to lose your prediction. So it's kind of like I ended up losing my position by monkeying around with those options, and which forced me to flip out the stock because I was flipping out the options, and it just turned into a bit of a disaster. A good disaster. I'm not, I'm not complaining, you know, a little bit maybe. But I ended up losing my position by the end of the day, and then I actually went in and, and, and reestablished it in after hours trade. So I kind of didn't achieve the goal that I wanted to do. But you, you don't want to lose your position. Maybe if you're not using options, you could peel off a few hundred shares to take some of those that gift horse, okay? And you know, here's the thing, even if a position if a position goes to the moon, even if you have a few hundred shares on, at least you're gonna get a, a piece of that. And it could be a substantial piece over time if it makes a longer term move, obviously. So your dilemma is you don't want to give up your position, but you also don't want to watch those overnight profits evaporate. So basically, you want to have your cake and eat it too. You don't want your profits to go away, but you want to keep your position. If you keep your position, those profits could evaporate, okay? If you take those profits, you lose your position, and then the market could take off without you. And so you make $3 overnight, yay, I'm gonna tell all my friends, and the next day, it goes up 100%, okay? That doesn't happen often, but it can happen. All right, so let's take a look at what happened with the SST. So overnight, it doesn't look like much based on that big wide bar, but it was a significant move. It was up about three bucks overnight. So just a reminder, I got back in this one in after hours trading because according to the trading service, I should have a position. So if somebody asked me, Dave, where's your stop in, in this? Instead of looking at the spreadsheet, I can look at my trade and say oh okay i can tell you exactly where the stop is because i'm actually in the trade and i feel your pain if it's it's doing poorly and if it's doing well i know and uh, you know it's like i share in the in the joy so i have skidded a game on these things is the point i'm trying to make now the stop was at 18. now the reason i put the stop at 18 was this thing flew all the way up to, to 37 came back in, did like a, a bottle rocket type of move as I call them. And I just figured that it, it should not close the gap, okay? And that's why I bumped the stop up to 18. And luckily, and it came dangerously close as you can see, and, and I have no crystal ball, I just got lucky on this one flat out, okay? Oh good, John said he missed the initial entry Friday and reset the 1575 entry which triggered on Monday. Yeah, I I did. I kind of mucked up. You know, I'm, I'm admitting a lot. I'm admitting a lot of guilt here because I did get in late on this one, but I'm glad that I did. Now, the thing is, you're up three bucks overnight. So the, the question to ask yourself: that three dollars could evaporate really, really quickly. What if you buy options? and trade out of the stock via a trailing stop. So you got a three point profit. What if you can buy an option that's, let's say that costs three bucks or thereabouts, and then hold on to your shares as long as you can via an intraday trailing stop. And you, you effectively, you double your position size. And I know this is dangerous stuff and I was a little hesitant to show you, show you this tonight. But I think that you guys have been around for a while. I mean, some of you guys have been with me for 20 years, you know, and I think you're ready for something else other than me drawing a big blue arrow on the chart, you know, something a little bit more involved in the trend following more on stuff. So that's why I'm showing you these things. So I picked up five calls at 320. Now remember, I'm up $3.20 overnight. So if I exit the stock now, I made $3.20 and I bought some, and I still have my position. So it's kind of like, I, my risk goes to zero on the position, sort of, okay? Depends on how you look at it. But I bought five calls at $3.20, and I'm up 
and these are the 20 calls. They were a little bit in the money. And I think the stock was right around there at the time. So it was almost three bucks. And I was amazed that these things were fairly cheap. And then I trailed the stop higher and got out at 22.69. So I still picked up a decent amount of money overnight on the shares. Okay, so I was able to grab that almost three point profit, right? Maybe a little less. And I ended up with some options. Now, those options more than doubled in value. And I got to thinking, you know, I could flip out a couple of those and pay for the options. Even though the shares just paid for the options, I could pay for those options again. And so I decided to flip out two of those calls. Now, my position size has been reduced effectively to 300 versus 500, but this thing has made such a big move. It's kind of like what I said earlier. I'm kind of feeding the ducks a little bit in this situation. So I flipped out two at 750, and the math on all that is 2269 overnight minus 1929. Remember, because I, I got back in the position and after hours at 1929 to keep my position on times 500 shares, that comes to a $1,700 profit overnight. Now the options cost me initially $1,600, but from that $1,600, I was able to get back $1,500, okay? So you add all that up and I made $1,600 overnight, okay? And now that option position, those three remaining calls is paid for so to speak. And I know you got to be careful because funds are fungible. And I hope I'm saying that correctly. It's not the market's money. It is my money. And by the way, that's one thing you got to watch out for. And I think on the same day that I had this trade, I'm feeling pretty flush. Oh, look at that. It's a 10 grand. This one account overnight. I'm feeling pretty good. And I got a little loose and easy with a day trade or two and it got away from me. But luckily, a lot of other trades worked out. And I ended up having an okay day on the intraday stuff, but it would have been three times as much had I not gotten a little wide and loose with the uh, with the cash, free and loose or free and easy, I think is what I'm trying to say. In other words, I was a little lottery rich on all this stuff, and it does go to my head. <laughs> and I do have an ego, and as I've said a thousand times, I took a test on agreeableness. I took a test on a personality test, and my agreeableness was off the charts beating that i do not like to be wrong and i tend to disagree there was a meme i can't pull up on the, on the fly but it's a, <laughs> it says a proper ending to any monopoly game and it was a this board just thrown all across the house and crap it was everywhere so if you played monopoly with me that's probably how it's going to end <laughs> so uh whether i win or lose if i win i'm going to be such a jerk uh you'll be upset. And if I lose, that, that'll that probably be throwing the board around. But anyway, I don't like to lose. I don't like to be wrong. So I'm working on all these things, believe me. But Dave, you were working on that 20 years ago. I know. <laughs> uh, what is it? Uh, I need to write it down so I remember it. Uh, Incora, Impara, something like that. Encora, Encora, Impara. I'm still learning, as Michelangelo said in his 80s. So all this is pretty cool, huh? Well, it's not always that easy and it doesn't always work that well like it did today. But if you could figure out a way to sort of have your cake and eat it too, okay? Be able to keep your position but take some profits, then go for it. And obviously you can keep part of your position if you exit part of the other part of your position, right? Feed the ducks while they're quacking. But if you could figure out something with options in a case like this, where the shares paid for the options and the options paid for the options, and then I still have a position going into tomorrow. The problem is it does expire tomorrow, and that's a can of worms, as I will talk about now. <laughs> so one thing it does is it increases the amount of, of moving parts in a trade. And sometimes people will show me things and well, it's this option thing, and you buy a put, you sell the call, and blah, 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 blah. It's like, whoa. Settle down there, Beavis. <laughs> you do a lot of stuff with a lot of moving parts. And simpler, in general, is better when it comes to markets. So it does increase the number of moving parts, and it does open a can of worms when you start adding derivatives to the equation. Now, 
What happens if the options expire worthless? Well, this is part of the reason I took the partial profits because I can live with a $3 option expiring worthless. Yeah, I might drop an F-bomb and be a little pissed off or whatever, but a $7 option or a $10 option, especially if I have a few of these things on, it starts to add up. And it's like, before you know it, you've got, let's just say five grand in options and Friday, 3 p.m. my time, 4 p.m. Eastern is coming up really, really soon. That's one thing about options that I, you know, I try to steer away from them, but when it especially becomes educational business. But when I talk about them, it's later, it's sooner than you think. Okay, you could buy an option and think, oh, I've got oceans of time, and all of a sudden, bam, that time has flown by. That's why option sellers make a lot of money until they don't. Eventually, they get whacked. They get whacked when when we are printing money. That's when they blow up. They're blowing up as our us making money. So looking at that, and I did it across multiple accounts, and I'm completely out of my shares on SST, but I have end the money options still. So what's going to happen tomorrow with those end the money options? It's going to complicate things when I go to manage those positions. Okay. Or it probably won't be worth my while to roll out into into out a uh, calendar spread it out because the applied volatility is whack and it seems like when the applied volatility gets whack the options that are a little further out cost the bloody fortune now i'm not an options expert and i don't want to bother larry but to ask him but maybe one of you guys will know that there's probably a reason for that because the applied so whack people think it has the potential to make this this unbelievable move. In, in a case like the SST, the, the bomb has already exploded on that one. The volatility has already exploded. I would imagine that the volatility is going to settle down in this thing. I would never sell options outright, but those expensive options are probably going to become cheap is what I'm saying. Please don't go sell options on this one. <laughs> so, Part of my thinking today, just so you can kind of get into my head, and basically, don't get too far in my head, but uh, <laughs> what I want you to think, or, or what I want, the point I want to make is I want to teach you how to think about markets. So think in terms of how can I reduce risk when I have this gift, this gift horse given to me? When the, when the ducks are quacking, maybe I should feed them a little bit, okay? And... The way you succeed in this business is longevity. And the way you achieve longevity is controlling your risk, right? Don't sell the options, never have unlimited risk, okay? Always be looking to take risk off. Now, obviously we have to put risk on, like today kind of, that's kind of like doubling up both ends against the middle. I got burned on it the day before, right? But, it can work and it can work nicely. So I sort of doubled up today, caught a little bit of move here, and then I caught another move here. But the whole time it's like, okay, I got this move, trailing stops could take me out, bam, I'm out of that one. Okay, now we're way up here. This thing really did take off. You know, I wish I still had these, but so be it, you know, that in the poking eye, right? But think in terms of, of risk on, but as soon as you do risk on, risk off, risk off, risk off, risk off. And the secret to another secret to longevity, as I've said a thousand times before, is figure out a way to establish free positions. Okay. Take a look at that ARLP. Go back to that portfolio earlier in the slide, rewind it to the beginning. And I forget how much that one's up 100%, 200%, whatever it is. But we've been in that stock forever. And that's kind of free position or free rolling, so to speak, because we've already taken. Our, we already taken our money off. Now, getting back to the, the options thing and the dilemma is, okay, so I bought these short dated options. And basically what I did was a gamma play. And that's why you don't want, you never want a short gamma, the old option expression gamma gets you. But I'm looking to be on the other side of the gamma. I'm looking to buy gamma in these things. Gamma is a rate of change of delta. If you Google it, you'll know more about it than I do but I know that gamma will get you and these short dated options could be a beautiful play. Tomorrow, for instance, if the ETFs are looking pretty good and it looks like we're gonna have a major reversal, an opening gap reversal or some sort of 
the follow through, especially after some fake out, tomorrow those ETFs might be underpriced, at least from my perspective, meaning that I think they can probably go up in price as opposed to getting in the share. So I'll buy I'll buy Friday expiration ETF options on these direction shares or whatever they call those things, if I think I can get them cheaply. Now, not to digress too far, one of the dangerous things to do, easy for me to do, is, is like, oh, okay, well, it's only a few hundred dollars I'm putting at risk, who cares? Well, a few hundred dollars adds up. As I often say, you lose a hundred dollars a day, it's 25 grand a year. You lose $400 a day, that's a hundred thousand dollars a year and it begins to add up after a while anyway getting back to the options so what happens tomorrow if my options expire and hopefully they expire well into the money do i buy the outright shares if i buy the outright shares i roll you know here's a dilemma i'm just kind of thinking out loud but let's say the stock takes off tomorrow let's hope it takes off tomorrow right and i sell those shop, uh, stock shares at a big profit do I try to buy super duper expensive options while the stock's oversold, overbought? I mean, and they're gonna cost me a bloody fortune, okay? Do I buy the outright shares while it's overbought knowing it's just gonna crash down on me? And I don't have the answer for that, but my thinking when something's going parabolic like this, at least earlier this week, is if I can flip out of my shares and hold on to options, then that's gonna be a good problem to have and I can figure it out. So tomorrow, I guess I'm gonna have to be careful and not get too emotional and do something very logical and sensical, if that's a word, so I could show you what happened. So how do you get back in? What do you do? I don't have the answer to that. Oh, there it is. So what I'm saying is I don't have all the answers. If I did have all, if I, if I did have all the answers, my poor daughter, she does that too. She'd be in the middle of the sentence. I know she got it from me. A lot of other bad habits, but uh, the point I'm trying to make is I don't have all the answers. If I had all the answers, you probably never see my fat ass again. The reason I'm here is, because I don't have all the answers. I was thinking right before we went live, it's like the, the guys that claim they had all the answers, you know, with the rented Lambos and the, and the rented Jets, you know, they're being sued for $127 million because they ripped off everybody. I just got through watching uh, Trust No One. It was kind of interesting. It, it kind of ended with a bit of a dud, but I, I thought it was okay. It's about the, uh, Bitcoin, one of the Bitcoin just exchanges. That was a complete scam. I'm kind of a sucker for all those documentaries. I think it's called Trust No One. It's on uh, Netflix. Pretty good. It's it's worth watching. One thing I did discover is is you can if you watch it on a PC, you can up your speed to like one and a half times, and get it, it does move a little slow. So anyway, I digress. So again, as long as I can get you to think, and I think that's the goal tonight is think in terms of taking risk off, and not letting profits completely evaporate and ways to keep your position. Now, I don't want to talk out of both sides of my mouth. And it's probably good, it's not good for me, but it's probably good that I did get burnt what I was trying to do a couple of days ago to, to make me be a little bit more cautious in doing that. But what I did today was effectively double up. But as soon as I'm doubling up, I'm already saying, okay, I'm up three points. I've got a trailing stop here. So it's gonna hopefully keep trailing that up and I'll, and I'll get two or three bucks at least out of the shares. I was spending three bucks on the options. I'm going to be doubled up for a little while today, maybe all day. If that trailing stop would have been a little looser, I could have gotten um, in. A, I could have gotten out a lot more higher on those shares. I trust dogs in the bond market. JC Perez. Ah, awesome. <laughs> Give me a shout out to JC. JC, uh, I stole from JC the um, somebody else's problem, like below a certain level. I did a presentation on that a while back. Well, Craig, I'm glad you're here. Craig's a celebrity. Craig's a famous dog trainer. I trust dogs in the bond market. <laughs> Good point. Yeah, I think Craig's point is you have to be skeptical, okay? All right, uh, let's jump into crypto real quick. I'm probably not going to have a lot to say this week. Last week, I was kind of jazzed because it was making the mother of all comebacks, but I got stopped out of, I think, almost everything. So the ones in blue are ones that I've been watching, but... I probably need to clean that list up. The ones in pink, I was long. I might still have a small position in this one. Why? Because it's going up, okay? <laughs> uh, let's take a look at Bitcoin real quick. Let's see, this is a better one here. So as I say quite often, the 30-day EMA is your best friend when it comes to crypto. Write that down, okay? It's really your best friend. 
it'll keep you out of a lot of trouble. If a market is above its 30 in crypto, you might want to look to get long at a certain point, provided you've got some kind of pattern there. If it drops below its 30 day, you might want to exit. And in some cases, you might actually want to short the market. So these ones in cyan, I'm going to have to go through my portfolio, but I think I got knocked out of them. These were positions where I was free rolling and I got knocked out along the way. And I think poke is a mistake. I'm not supposed to be, I never did take that trade. But you can see, let's go through these blue ones real quick and then let's sort by strength. So these blue ones are ones that I'm watching or at least were watching. And you can see cake bar one, bar two, if you're trading the 20 EMA, would have got you in here. And hopefully you would have taken profits up here. You know, it was at 40% higher. It's retrace, and now it looks like it's trying to make a leg higher. So I like that one. Maybe make that one green. And you know, I'll do this on my own time. But I just want to go through a few of these. This one's trending, might be worth a shot at some point. B and B is pulled back to its EMA. It still looks okay. Another one that's pulled back to its EMA. It's got a couple of tails in it, so I'm not sure if that one's thin or not. Inch, one inch has pulled back and dropped below its 30 EMA. So at least at this point in time, the 30 EMA is something to keep an eye on in crypto. And from what I've seen, it can really do a good job of keeping you on the right side of the market. Now let's take a look at Ethereum. Ethereum actually looks okay because you've got a nice daylight coming up. You've got a nice little pullback to the EMA. I, I think Ethereum looks pretty damn good. I have a little, I don't have a little hodled, but I have a little ETHE, okay? Not a, not a lot, not a significant amount. But I'm trying to hang on to it, and it's hard for me as a, as a, as a guy who's a, a trader, you know? But I, it was about, I guess about six months ago, I became a believer in Ethereum, and I'm since not as much of a believer as I used to be. The internet's all excited about proof of stake. Uh, I think proof of stake might have some issues. And there's some there's some tomfoolery going on there. <laughs> Sound like an old fart. Okay, anyway, so as you go through these, you can see the ones above the 30 EMA or something you might want to look at. Let me just show you a uh, percent change sort now. I don't know when my charts flip over. Sometimes you could just buy the strongest ones like this Kono right now. Believe it or not, that's something I actually would consider buying because it's kind of going straight up, but be willing to have a stop in mind just in case you're wrong, okay? Take a stab at something like that. So there are a few in here that are strong. But it's not like it was last week. This LSS, I, I think I have a small position. By small, I mean tiny here, okay? But you can see there's a few that are doing okay in here. Uh, focus on the stronger ones. That one might be worth a shot if it's thick enough, okay? All right, so John, let's take a look at Alice. Go ask Alice. Okay. No, okay, and and I might change my mind at some point in time, but right now I'm looking at this 30 EMA, and that seems to be a pretty good uh, litmus test for the crypto. So I mean, it's not horrible. I guess technically you could say, well, it's kind of bottomed out, okay, kind of double bottomy, kind of cup and handily. It's not horrible, but for now I like things to be above the 30. But hey, guess what? No, not chicken butt. If you were to trade this, your entry would be above the 30 anyway. So I'm going to say it's okay. My initial reaction was let's pass because it's below the 30. And I've been trying to work on some scans here just to save me because there's so many damn pairs now to look at. But I've been trying to work on some scans that'll just show me those above the 30 because the chances are very slim that I would buy anything below the 30. Okay, anybody else want to talk about any crypto? We'll go ahead and shift gears and pop out to the overall market. If you have any stocks you want to look at, 
I know we talk about stocks all day in Facebook, but we might have some people here that are not in Facebook. Facebook group is Dave Landry Trend Traders. You have to be a gold member. That keeps the riffraff out. I was it's one of my shower thoughts I had the other day. You know, Dave, your shower thoughts have changed. Yeah. <laughs> But I've been in quite a few, I know I've said this a thousand times, but I've been in quite a few groups. I mean, one was run by John Bollinger and there were a bunch of professionals in this group and you would think that it wouldn't morph or turn into Lord of the Flies, but it did. <laughs> so I think he might have a new group. He shut it down because it just was so crazy. It was, uh, he'd only, it was invite only and even invite only, it just, uh, it just got ugly after a while. I was never part of the ugliness, <laughs> but I was tempted, but got to behave. <laughs> I think all the time that I'd probably kicked off Facebook if I uh, <laughs> if I didn't have an educational business. Anyway, before I digress too, too far, let's take a look at this market. My big concern was that we would have a big old fat rally, get everybody excited, and then have it roll back over and trapped. And as I often say, I'm a man on the street kind of guy. And I've got a couple of buddies I work out with, believe it or not. I'm actually getting pretty buff. <laughs> like my wife says, you still have that belly. You always have that belly when you work out a lot. That's the last thing to go. I was like, yeah, I know. Because I like to eat and occasionally drink. But uh, anyway, he was defending his guy when his guy was getting more aggressive as the market rolled over. And then he started getting a little nervous but he never told me. And then when the market rallied up and then started dropping again, then he told me he was actually nervous. And so I think that's kind of the man on the street kind of guy. And, and another one of my friends is like, man, I took a beating yesterday. He never tells me about his equity swings because he's a longer term buy and hold guy. I think that's what his financial dude has him in as a longer term buy and hold guy. But now that he's become friendly with me, he's wondering, I think he's wondering a little bit about this trading thing. Anyway, long story endless, my point is this little slide, these people took notice. You know, the first little slide, it's like, oh, it'll come back, it'll be fine, you know. But now that it's it's come back a little and begin and begun to roll back over, I think it's gonna have a lot of people nervous. But let's give it the benefit of the doubt for now, but check back often. But the P's had a decent day. We close a little gap in here. Let's take a look at the spiders to see if we've got a true gap. Yeah, so we close the true gap. And let's just see how it shakes out. If we take out this today's low in earnest, 44.50, it kind of scares me because there's really nothing for a long, long way. It's 300 points or so in the P's. And that would really scare the bejesus out of everyone. Since we're down here, let's take a look at bonds. Bonds hit brand new lows today. Bonds down, rates up. Three quarters of a percent, that's a decent, sizable down move for bonds, okay? Take a little dollar. Dollar actually hit new highs. Okay, so that's a good thing. At least the dollar's kind of hanging in there. If the dollar begins to implode, I'm going to get a little nervous. NASDAQ composite, a little bit bigger gap there. Like I said in the, in the market in a minute and recently in some of my webinars, this is a little bit more indicative of what I'm concerned about. So we get this big fat rally up. Everybody that brought her either buys back stocks they got shaken out of or the buy and hold folks, like I'm friends with, breathe a sigh of relief, and then all of a sudden the market rolls right back over. It, it all comes back to the the adage that I beat that I beat adages that I beat to death from that I picked up from Linda Rasky. Market will do what it has to do to cause the most amount of pain most amount of people. And the corollary is the market will do the obvious thing in an unobvious manner. So if the market looks like it's rolling over, what's going to happen? It's going to have a big old fat rally first to make it look like everything's fine. And then it's going to roll over. And if you think about all these things from a psychological standpoint, like I just kind of walk you through with a friend of mine. Okay, market's iffy. I'm not going to worry about it. Okay. Oh, thank God it's coming back. Market gets iffy again. And it's like, oh, crap, here we go again. So that's kind of the man on the street thing. That's the psychology behind it. Okay. Quarter in window dressing, still horrible breath. I was about to say, it's like, <laughs> gotcha. Okay, so so what Craig is saying is there's a quarter in quarter in window dressing dressing happening, and but the quarter's already ended, right? Oh, that was the end of the quarter. I got you. 
and the breath is bad. Yeah, you know, the thing is, in spite of the market improving like it has, I'm not seeing a lot of stocks that are set up other than these speculative low stocks at low levels like these uh, electric car companies that are on the fringe, you know, like out there, like uh, what's the one, uh, NKLA and, and, you know, stocks at low levels like that. Take a look at tonight's Landry list. So a lot of those stocks at low levels that are super duper speculative, a few weed stocks and stuff like that. All right, let's take a look at energies. Let's, okay, Russell. Uh, Russell 2000, just real quick, we take out these lows. We're still at relatively high levels longer term. It could get ugly fast, as I've been saying, ad nauseum. It's just kind of chopping around here in a range. As long as it stays in a range, let's not get too excited. But if that range gets taken out, energies and some ETFs, yes. So speaking of energies, there's energies. Craig says energies and some ETFs. That's what you're still on? Yeah, I agree with that. Um, I actually am, am using the trend following moron system with with some uh, with a metals fund and with a an energy fund. Not because I wanted to do that. I've got some money kind of trapped, so to speak, where I can't really move it around. And I'm not going to put an S&P 500 right now, so that's where I've got it parked. And people always say, I can't believe you don't have long term holdings. Well, I have a few long term holdings, but not a lot. OK, I mostly trade now. I do have stocks that I've been in for a year and a half. One in particular, ARLP, you know, and then I, I held another one before that a year or two. And I hope when I get into a stock, I'm I'm in that stock forever. But I, I'll get stopped out usually a lot sooner. Energies again, looking pretty good in here. Take a look at metals and mining. Metals and mining looking great. OK, just kind of nice little uptrend so far. So good there. Some areas though, banging on new lows. Durable's banging on new lows. Excuse me. Financial services. This is kind of the pattern I was kind of worried about. Big rally up, roll back over. But on the flip side, take a look at drugs. Okay, drugs are looking good. So I hate to say it because I think it's always a stock picker's market. I kind of hate when people say, oh, it's a stock picker's market. But it is a stock picker's market. So if I see some drugs start to set up in here, I'm going to buy drugs, okay? Biotech, not as good as drugs overall, but it has been improving as of late. Health services starting to improve quite a bit, kind of bottoming out in here and not too, too far from all-time high. Spinning disks is 3%, 4%, uh, right at about 4%, less, a little less than 4% away from all-time highs. But as you go through these, you'll see some that was manufacturing M and C is is tried about look look like a big old fat bottom and kind of rolling back over in here. That might have a bit of a head and shoulders look to it. But one thing I was saying either last night or earlier tonight, a head and shoulders. I'm not a fan of a head and shoulders bottom at high levels. I like a market to hit like 10 year lows and make a head and shoulders bottom. Take a look at transports. How crazy is this? This is the market that we live in, right? It looked like it was going to break down. It just looked ugly AF, right? Okay. And then it melted straight up. And then it rolled straight back over. <laughs> Even ludicrous would say that's ludicrous. Software, it's, it's trying to bottom out a little bit, but I still think it's in trouble in here longer term. The semis, I'm a little more concerned about the semis. This is kind of, again, that pattern. Yeah, it's a little head and shoulder bottom looking, but that might take weeks, months, or even longer to, to play out. For now, it kind of looks like a big retrace and rolling right back over. Utilities, back to the upside. So there's a few areas still in decent uptrends. Utilities, drugs, metals and mining, energies. You know, it's kind of like a handful, literally a handful. But anyway, utilities right at new highs. Okay, any, any individual issues you want me to take a look at for you? Craig says, party like it's 2007. Yeah, <laughs> party like it's 1999. I'd rather do that. But yeah, let's pay attention to what's happening. Um, 2007, I was just seeing a ton of shorts as the market hit new highs. I'm not seeing a ton of shorts right now, but that that could change quickly. Check back often, obviously. Okay, any any stock picks? Going once, going twice. <laughs> All right. Well, I want to thank everybody for coming. I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule. Anything unanswered? 
if you're not in the Facebook group, bring on Facebook if you're in Facebook, but anything I answered, David, Dave, .com. Or ideally though, leave a comment below if you're not in Facebook, that way I can answer it and everybody can see the answer, good, bad, or indifferent. All right, everybody have a great weekend. We're gonna talk again. I'll see everybody tomorrow on Facebook and everyone else, I'll see you next week, hopefully. Thank you so much.